Hey guys, uh, I just thought I'd start two minutes early just so that you guys have a chance to catch up and hop on here because I'm, I'm still just kind of figuring out how this all works and today I finally figured out to make the live interactive. So as you guys are jumping on and joining our little lesson um, just wave or say something so that I know you're on here with me. It's more fun when we do this with friends for sure. Maybe I should invite, maybe I should invite my friends to jump on here with me. Um, hmm. I wonder why nobody's coming up here. Uh, okay, I'm just inviting you guys to pop on here with me so that you can see where I am, so that you can find me. Um, it's more fun with friends. So... I have invited some of you. You're all invited. <laughs> I was just inviting some of you specifically, but you're all invited. So anyway, today as we get started, we are on truth link number four, war in heaven. And this is absolutely a great one for the time that we are in right now. What is evil? Why is evil here? And uh, so before we start, let's just say a prayer. Hey, Jody. Let's say a prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit um, to be here with us. Precious Heavenly Father, we have a lot to be thankful for. Uh, we're very grateful for your word. We're so grateful that you have all these promises um, that we can cling to, hold on to. We know that there's hope. We know that there's light. And we know that you are the author of all life. So we ask for your Holy Spirit as uh, we open your word and as we try to learn more about who you are, we thank you for showing up and bless my friends and their journey as they um, learn about you also. We love you. Amen. Okay, so number four, war in heaven. So relevant for where we are right now. Our world is the center of a cosmic conflict between good and evil with a history that reaches back to an angelic rebellion. The issue under dispute is the character of God, the origin of evil. The Bible teaches that we humans are not alone in the universe as the only rational sentient free will creatures from genesis to revelation we encounter an order of being called angels hi andrea uh, we know from scripture that the angels predate the existence of humans and those scriptures are job 38 4 through 7 and revelation 1 verse 20 that they are numerous, Hebrews 12, 22, that they are powerful and intelligent, Psalms 103, 20, and Daniel 4, 17, and that they function with, within an orderly system of governance under appointed leaders, Ephesians 3, 10, and Daniel 7, 9 through 10 and that they actively operate within our world, mostly unseen, but sometimes in visible form, and that's in Hebrews 1, 14, and Hebrews 3, 2. And that the reality of evil that afflicts our world originated with them, 
and that's found in Revelation 12, 7 through 12. One of the angels was Lucifer. A Lucifer means bearer of light, a name bestowed upon him by his creator to signify his character and mission. This exalted being was to occupy a position of intimacy with God and thus to be a preeminent revealer, a teacher of God's character to his fellow angels. Lucifer was perfect in all his ways. His patterns of thought, feeling, and behavior until iniquity was found in him. At this point, he began to bear the name Satan, which means adversary. While the image of Satan has been trivialized and fictionalized into a cartoonish red man with horns and a pitchfork, the biblical picture is of a super powerful, highly intelligent, magnificently beautiful, and totally non-fictional fallen angel who is the originator of the very real evil that haunts and hurts our world. Read Isaiah 14, 12 to 4. I hope you have your Bibles too. Isaiah 14, 12 to 4. And let's see what it says about Lucifer. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Whew. It's pretty bold and rebellious, isn't it? Now we're going to go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19. Hi, Ma. Ezekiel 28, uh, 12 to 19. And it says, Son of man, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You, cor you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst. I, it devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth. In the sight of all who saw you, all who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror. You shall be no more forever. We know that's going to happen one of these days. Satan's not destroyed yet, but he will be. 
So at first, Lucifer was created perfect. He was the covering cherub. He was uh, the very one who was pr to protect the law of God. And here he comes in accusation against his creator. And uh, he, he fell because of his beauty. It says your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Wonder what he looked like. <laughs> anyway, okay. Self-exaltation was the worm at the core of the evil that Lucifer chose to actualize in himself, leading to the heady aspiration to displace God from the hearts of his fellow angels and usurp, what's that word, usurp, <laughs> usurp their loyalty. As Lucifer nurtured self-centeredness in himself, he ceased to reflect the light of God's character and began to attribute to God his own self-serving motives. The aspiration, I will exalt myself, followed by, I will be like the Most High, indicates that Lucifer began attributing self-exaltation to the character of God as justification for his own. By denying the essential goodness of God's character, Satan's course of action was calculated to erode trust towards God and incite rebellion against him. <clears throat> Thus, the Bible informs us that war broke out in heaven, and that's found in Revelation 12 or 7. The word here translated war in, is polemos in the Greek, which is related to words like polemic and politics. This clues us in on the precise nature of the war Satan launched against God. It was not primarily a war of physical engagement or force of arms. It was a political war or propaganda campaign, a character assassination scheme. Satan waged his war by disseminating lies regarding who God is at heart. Thus, he is described as the one who deceives the whole world and as a liar and the father of it. And that's found in Revelation 12, 9 and Job 8, 44. So put these pieces together and you'll discover additional insight into the core issue involved in Lucifer's rebellion. Ezekiel says that Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he sinned, Ezekiel 28, 16. John defies sin as lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4, and Paul defines God's law as love, Romans 13, 10. So clearly then, Lucifer rebelled against God's law and therefore against God's love. He raised charges against God and against the law of love by which God governs the universe, whereas the Bible claims that God is love and that his law is therefore a law that governs by the princip principles inherent in love. 1 John 4, 8 and Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Satan has set out to live without love and portray God's law as a list of arbitrary rules imposed for purposes of control, but unnecessary as a way of life. Hmm. So why do evil and suffering exist? What a good, good question right now, right? There's a lot of suffering and evil that exists right now. and We're seeing a lot of sadness. At some point in life, every human being asks one of the most pressing and significant of all questions. Why do evil and suffering exist? In what we've discovered re regarding the rebellion of Lucifer, we have the starting place for the answer to that question. Now, let's go a little deeper by first considering the fact that within the entire scope of human thought, only four basic explanations for the existence of evil are offered. 
Number one, naturalism, the atheist worldview. And that says that there's no such thing as evil or as a moral evil as a moral category. All there is is natural process. Suffering is part of that process and is necessary for the evolution of the strong and the elimination of the weak. Okay, that's the naturalist view. Number two, pantheism, and that's the God and all as all worldview that says there's no personal God, but rather that nature itself and the natural processes of life constitute an impersonal divine force. Evil is viewed as a balancing force in nature and suffering as the inevitable process of the wheel of life. As in naturalism, there's nothing other than natural process, and that's pantheism. Does that remind you of, uh, boy, what came to mind for me was Star Wars. <laughs> Balancing force, anyway. Deterministic theism, number three. The control worldview says that God's main characteristic is power and his main objective is control. God predetermines all events and human beings are merely the subjects upon which he, his will acts. Evil and suffering are therefore ordained by God according to his sovereign will. Okay, that's the deterministic theism view. Number four, benevolent theism. This is the relational worldview that says God's main characteristic is love. And his main objective is that we would be voluntary reciprocators of his love. Evil and suffering are therefore ultimately the result of the misuse of free will for chosen anti-love purposes. The Bible clearly teaches the fourth option by claiming that love is the fundamental essence of God's identity. It logically follows from the premise that God is love. That God is a relational being whose very existence is defined by a dynamic flow of giving and receiving. It further, further follows that if love is the essence of God's character, then love must be the objective for us which necessitates that free will must be granted to us, literally built into the system of life in order that may love may occur. It becomes evident, therefore, that in seeking to answer the question of evil's existence, a basic three-part equation logically emerge emerges. And I'll show you the little uh, thing here. It has love, freedom, and risk. So without love, you can't have love without freedom, and you can't have freedom without risk. Okay. The risk inherent in freedom with its ideal of love is that free moral agents with their majestic potential for love might choose selfishness instead. God lives within that risk, as do we, with all its glorious possibilities and horrific dangers. In biblical thought, evil is not an eternal principle inherent and necessary to the operations of reality, nor is it God's will. Rather, evil is the product of personal, free, moral agency gone bad first with angels and then with human beings. Speaking of the evil in our world, Jesus said, an enemy has done this. And that's in Matthew 13, 28. In other words, God is not the source of the bad things in our world. Rather, Satan is. With human consent and cooperation, Thus, Satan's anti-love mode of existence was implemented in our world. God made people good, but they have found all kinds of ways 
to be bad. Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Okay, let's go to Isaiah. It says, read Isaiah 14, 15 through 17. Isaiah 15. Oh, 15 through 17. And it says, and this is speaking of the fall of Lucifer again. It says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest pits. Oh, I already read that. I'm sorry. I read farther. I'm going to read it again anyway. Um, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook the kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, and who did not open the house of his prisoners? Hmm. <clears throat> so Lucifer shook the kingdoms, made the world a wilderness, destroyed its cities, and kept prisoners. Okay. Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. Go with me to Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. And this says <clears throat> I love this scripture. It's good news. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. Because he knows he has a short time. So that means his time is running out. Good, good news. All right, 1 Peter 5, 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. And it says, Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, I've got one more. I want you to go to Romans. Romans 1, 28 to 32. Romans 1, 28 to 32, and it says, even And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but also approve, but also approve of those who practice them. Hmm. Okay, so we just discovered that all evil, oppression, enslavement, prejudice, hatred, violence, abuse, and every else, everything that is contrary to love has its origin in the principles of Satan's kingdom. I want you to remember that. Everything that is contrary to love has its origin in Satan's kingdom. Then we're going to read James 1.17 to see the opposite principles of Christ's kingdom. James 1 verse 3. <laughs> I had this memorized as a kid once upon a time. <laughs> James 1 verse 3. Knowing, oh wait, hang on. 
not James 1 3 James 1 17 <laughs> James 1 17 every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning so we know that every good gift comes from God. James 1, Andrea, James 1, 17. Um, and then Galatians 5, 22. Let's go and figure out what are some other principles of Christ's kingdom because we know that Satan's kingdom is manipulation, deceit, everything that is contrary to God's kingdom. So Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law so everything that is pure lovely liberating noble healing peaceful joyous and beautiful has its origin in the principles of god's kingdom this brings us to the final point of the Bible's logic regarding evil, and it is this. Because evil is fundamentally contrary to the character of God and to the natural operations of his love, it is temporary and will ultimately be eliminated. I know, that's such good news, isn't it? <laughs> It will not be around forever. Evil is temporary and it will be gone. And Psalms 37 9 says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea, and that's Isaiah 11, 9. As we continue our study of scripture, truth by truth, point by point, we will discover God's plan for eliminating evil and restoring other-centered love to human hearts as the only principle of our existence. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Very exciting. Jesus went to battle against Satan on our behalf and demonstrated the superiority of love over evil. There are two kingdoms, two antagonistic principles, two diametrically opposed motives contending for the mastery of our world in every human heart. Wow. Jesus leads the kingdom of truth and love. Satan, the adversary of all that is good and beautiful and true, leads the kingdom of deception and selfishness. A comparative illustration was offered by Christ. And he said, when a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he's trusted and divides his spoils. Luke eleven twenty one and 22. The strong man represents Satan, but Jesus claims to be stronger than he. Satan's kingdom is based on deception, self-exaltation, and violence. Jesus' kingdom is actuated by truth, selflessness, and non-coercive love. 
When Jesus suffered the murderous rage of humans and demons at the cross without responding in kind, responding in fact with only self-giving love, Satan's kingdom was conquered and his accusations against the character of God were proven false. By voluntarily dying on the cross with unyielding love for his enemies, Jesus defeated evil in principle, in set in motion a course of redemption that ensures its ultimate defeat. That's amazing. There's a scripture that says, I can't remember where it is, right off the top of my head, but it says that um, Jesus made a public spectacle of the demons and of Satan when he died on the cross. He made them the laughing stock, and all of the universe and created world saw that God is love and continues to be. That he poured out his blood on Calvary for us. He loves us that much. Okay, it says experience. I understand that we're involved in a war between good and evil and that Jesus is the heavenly warrior sent with truth and love to rescue us. Jesus came to our world to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Any of us who so choose may be empowered by his grace to break free from the bondage of Satan. By his life and death, Jesus ignited a revolution of truth and love that will finally vanquish evil. It lies with each of us to allow Jesus access to our lives so that the devil's deceptive power may lose its hold on us. Isn't that good news? The devil does not have to have any power over you or over me. We do not have to be slaves to sin. We do not have to be slaves to evil and to the chains that bind us in this world. And I think right now, why I'm getting so emotional over this is because I have a friend. Oh, she's homeless. She's experienced homelessness right now. And there's a battle out for her soul. And God brought her into my life through a series of miracles. It was really interesting. But I'm on this roller coaster with her. And when I see the deception and the lies that she believes, it breaks my heart. And I just want her to be free and I want her to recognize who she really is, that she's chosen, that she's holy, that she's loved, that she's adopted, that she's redeemed, that she's a child of the Most High God, that she can be sealed with the Holy Spirit if she chooses. And, you know, I know that God is real because he is living within my heart and he's pulling out all the selfishness and all the pride and all the self-reliance it's hard work for him but uh the good news is i just have to be willing i just have to show up every day and the other night at 3 30 in the morning i woke up and turtle was heavy on my heart and I couldn't go back to sleep, so I knew that I had to get up and pray for her. And so I got up and I, I wrestle with God for her because I believe that she is going to have victory through Jesus Christ over the demons that bind her. 
the demon alcohol, the demons of drugs, uh, the, the brokenness that she's experienced. And I spoke with her this morning. She's not sober. And it hurts my heart. And I hate this roller coaster that I'm on with her. It sucks. <laughs> it's awful. But I told her, Turtle, God woke me up at 3.30 the other morning to pray for you. And she said, oh, it must be because at 3.30 I was starting to drink. So that's how, friends, I know that God is real. Because he loves Turtle so much that he wakes me up. I lose sleep because I've been called to battle the demons and the forces for her because she cannot battle them on her own. So I want you to know that this war, that this battle that wages in our world is very real. And I want you to know <laughs> that Jesus Christ has already won. So the choice is yours. Whose side are you going to choose? Are you going to choose life? Are you going to choose selfishness? That's all there is. There's only two sides. It's that simple. So, friends, I just pray for you. Um, you're on my hearts. Every name, I've got all these lists. And I pray for you and I believe, I believe with all my heart in the power of intercessory prayer. So if you think about it, I would just ask you, please join me in praying for our sister turtle because turtle is so precious, so precious to God. She seems um, pretty broken and it seems pretty impossible. But I told her, there is no reason God would have not brought you into my life if you were not going to be victorious over these demons. So I believe that Turtle is going to be restored to an abundant life. I don't know exactly what that means. But please join me in praying for her if you believe. And I am so grateful for you for that. Thank you. Thank you for praying for Turtle. And um, God bless you guys in your journey. Um, we've been victorious. Evil will not win. It was destroyed at the cross. And one day soon, Jesus is going to restore his kingdom and make this earth new. So be encouraged. There is hope. There is light. There is life. God bless you. I'll talk to you guys later. I can't wait till next Monday at noon. And I still have one or two Truth Link lessons. I love them so much. And I will be happy to send them to you if you want to join us still. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Happy Monday. Sorry for the emotions. Whew. Talk to you later.